Rossin, head coach of Newbury Park High School. Winners at NXN this year on the boys' side. Girls finishing 17th, first time at nationals, also won state. Most pressing question everybody has is, how long does it take you to do your hair every day? <laughs> um, real quick, a couple minutes. <laughs> <laughs> You've had the luxury of being exposed to a lot of really good coaches over the years. Uh, who's probably your biggest mentor in the, as far as coaching goes? There's been a lot, you know. It's hard to say one in particular. You know, I do take a lot um, of different things from different people. You know, I mentioned Scott Simmons. I take a lot of stuff from him. But as far as like someone that I really looked up to as far as um, being dedicated to their craft and really want to being one of the best coaches is maybe a little controversial, but Alberto Salazar, um, he's been amazing to watch and amazing to be around. Um, you know, I was there during the whole Alberto and Jerry Schumacher. I've gotten a lot of great advice from Jerry too. Um, but I think I just was always around more at the races and was able to get more stuff from Alberto just because he was there. You know, now it, it you know, obviously I don't talk to him, but I talk to other coaches that I look up to and even Mike Smith, I talk to pretty often. And, you know, um, anyone that I really just over the years, I just stay in contact with. I really make sure that I, uh, um, I don't know, I've never really lost contact with a lot of people, I guess. I just always try to keep those contacts alive and I love talking training, sometimes too much. If you ask my wife, she'll think it's too much. Um, but I kind of use everything I get from everyone. I really do. What would you say is probably the best coaching advice you've received uh, that's really helped you as far as how you coach? You know, the best coaching advice I ever received, you know, there's a lot of different um, answers to that. But where I'm at now, I would say in the level I'm coaching at would be uh, the kids come first. You know, I just think... It's easy to get caught up in, you know, as my team did really well at the state meet and we go to NXN and being one of the top teams in the, in the country and now the top team in the country, I think it's, it's easy to sit back and kind of, um, it, it needs, they, they need to come first. And what's, you know, what's, it's about them, not about me and, or anything like that. And I think that was always the best advice as a high school coach I got. And I'm gonna stick with that because that's what I'm, the level I'm coaching at now. You know, at the end of the day, you know, I've talked to a lot of great, famous coaches, and a lot of them have, you know, it affects their personal life. You have to have somebody who understands what you're doing. I mean, I'm up to two, three in the morning doing training stuff, not writing workouts, but I'm reading, I'm watching stuff, I'm sending emails, and, and I mean, I, I was doing it last night, and I think it's important that we have those people in our lives that understand that. If I didn't have my wife and she didn't understand that, it, it would never work. Um, I, I don't think my team would be as good as they are. But people, you know, the best advice I got, it's a simple one, it's just you have to put the kids first. Um, and not take things too serious and then really just uh, um, sit back and enjoy the ride, you know? I mean, simple little things, but I think, you know, you might meet me and think I'm super intense with a lot of things, but I really believe at the end of the day, it's, you know, you can only do what you can do. How would you say you measure success nowadays? How I measure success, I think, um, it's effort. I mean, it has to be the effort you put in. During my um, semi-professional, when I was trying to run post-collegiately, um, a, a great runner, uh, Kyle Merber, once said something to me, you know, as I was trying to break four minutes and never did, he said, don't ever let that, um, like, define you. Don't let four minutes define you. What defines you is the process, what you're doing now and what you're learning to get there. And I've always brought that into my coaching. And he may not know it meant a lot to me, but he said that to me um, as I was at camp with him one year and he just said it off the whim and I always remembered it. And it's same thing with my kids, that you, you can't let it define you, you know, not the winning or losing, but it's the work you put in in the process. You mentioned you came in uh, partway through track and field season in 2016 yeah. and then cross country uh, in charge in the fall of 16. What was probably the first big change you needed to make in the program? Um, it, it didn't have a whole serious or a dedicated culture to it. Um, I just kind of came in and I, I, I really just wanted to present the opportunity to the kids. I felt like there were a lot of kids that were somewhat talented that um, could run some decent times, you know, 920s, let's say under 420 or right around 420. None of them were doing that. And I felt like, we, I felt like it was looked at as a, as a, a sport that was like, eh, I'm just kind of doing this for fun. And, you know, no one really had aspirations of going to the state meet, CIF or anything like that. So when I came in, I just really wanted to expose them to more stuff. We started going to bigger meets. Like in track, we um, meet a champions, stuff like that. I wanted to add into the schedule where I felt like 
that it was a program that had a lot of uh, dual meets and like league stuff and never really left the Ventura area. And I just thought that we needed to be exposed to more. So if you just put a kid around professional athletes, they're gonna be exposed to more or, or elite athletes or kids that think a little bit um, you know, higher goals. So I just started you know, sitting the kids down and just kind of making them believe of, of what could happen. And it wasn't super successful in the first year or so. Um, it, it was rough. You know, I was catching some of the kids at the park on the swings, like skipping runs. And I either, I always joke, I said, I either thought I was gonna get fired or their parents were gonna complain about me because I, I told them, you know, straightforward. I said, listen, you guys are wasting my time. Nobody needs to do this. Um, you know, nobody needs to, uh, to sit here and, and, and not put the work in. If you don't want to put the work in, you can go join a water polo or do something else. Nothing against water polo, but <laughs> I always thought you could do something in other sport. I didn't want to be a coach like that. I just felt like if I was going to be, you know, if I'm going to be a teacher, I'm going to be a good teacher. If I'm going to be a coach, I'm going to be a good coach and I'm going to try to teach them everything I had to. When you came into the program, you mentioned uh, some of the challenges and the kids you know, out during, during practice out in the swings or whatever in the yeah. park. At what point would you say you first started noticing a change where they began to get it? There was a, there was a point at Newberry Park where everyone started to get it. And um, I had a guy on my team named Ethan Duffy. He rallied the team. Uh, when they saw his success, he held everybody accountable for my goals that I wanted for the team. And by him doing that, they saw his success. They saw him running the 1540s at a Woodward Park, which for my team then was very good. Now it probably wouldn't even make my top seven, but he got them to believe. And I honestly say I owe a lot of our success to him because he would hold the guys accountable. I would hear and see him talk to the guys on my team and say, like, knock it off, let's get going. And he, and he would tell me if anyone went to the park and he would, and I would have him talk to them. And as a team captain, that I think made all the difference in the world. He, I mean, he showed up at Portland last year when we won the national championships, at, you know, just to watch. I didn't even know he was gonna be there. I mean, we're standing on stage, I see him screaming. I couldn't believe it. And <laughs> I, I think he's a big part of that. And I just think that dedication that the other kids saw really made him, and the re I mean, made him that example person of like, look, you can do this. You mentioned earlier about, you know, you want to have the kids to basically enjoy their journey. How are you enjoying the journey at such a young age, you know, just a few years coaching and achieving so much? Yeah, I mean, and it, just a few years of having the success we've had, four years of cross country, winning the, the national championship. I mean, obviously I'm enjoying it a lot. I think it's <laughs> awesome, but it's been a little tough. You know, th there was a point where we, my first year coaching, we qualified for the state meet and we were ninth place as a team and we had never gone as a program to the state meet. Um, I was unhappy with it. I saw the kids happy with it. It made me think a little bit like, okay, we, they need to adjust what they think is good because they're better than that. My second year coach in cross country, we didn't make the state meet. We were eighth. Um, and I remember driving, dropping the kids off in the van that day. And I remember sitting home and saying, I don't think I'm, I'm right for this. I don't think I, I, I should coach. And um, I, I can't help these kids. I go, if I, they, they're a better team. This is my fault, I'm the coach. It took a, a conversation with a friend of mine, um, Christian Christian Murray, who I know pretty well. I saw him the next day and he just said, you can't base your life on teenage boys or teenage girls and the success that they have. Trust me, you're helping them. Cause I had this thing, I wasn't helping them. And, and I, I was down. I was like, I, I failed them. I mean, them walking back to the van was hard to handle. Um, the talk to them was hard to handle. I, I get emotional talking about it. I still think about the look on Jace Ashburner's face that I promised them we'd go to the state meeting. We couldn't get there. Um, that was hard. But I think that made me realize there's more than winning and teaching these kids a good thing and, and a value of, of the hard work. Um, but ultimately, it motivated us more as a team, um, made me adjust a few things um, as a coach, and maybe not put the emphasis on the kids as far as um, the importance of winning, um, more of putting in the work and enjoying the process. Some coaches, you know, they just coach and that's it. The good coaches, it involves a whole lot more. It involves fundraising. You gotta be a, a second parent in a sense, or an uncle to someone who's having a, maybe a, a rough time. Uh, There's so many other things outside of practice time, how do you, how do you balance that? 
some, well, number one, you probably know the kids better than they know themselves in the running aspect of it. Um, but no, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot to coaching high school. You, you know, you're right. There's fundraising, there's creating opportunity. You know, we do it, you know, we have a, a great camp in the summer. We go up to Big Bear for a long period of time. Um, but just creating opportunities outside of cross country. You, I guess you can be like a second parent to a lot of the kids, but you, you just got, I just got to remember that I'm, you know, I'm a big part of their lives and like the most successful coaches from all the advice I've gotten, especially high school is, you know, you're going to get there before the kids and you're going to stay there after the kids. You know, my day at school starts at five something in the morning and I probably don't get home to six or seven o'clock at night. And this is five days a week. My weekends are, are totally monopolized by either races or practice or something. Um, you know, obviously you have Sunday off, but um, it's just who I am. You know, I, I talk to a lot of great coaches and if it's not a part of your life and it's not your passion, I don't think you're going to be successful at the national level. You might get lucky and have a kid go to nationals one year and have an All-American or two um, if you have a big school. But I don't think you're going to be um, a Doug Souls at Great Oak. I don't think you're going to be a Dana Hills. I don't know um, uh, some of these coaches personally, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say they put almost just as much, if this not the same, almost just as much as time as I put into it. And it's, it's a lifestyle. Um, I don't know. It's not just a job. It's just who you are. You know, I don't think I could change that at this point. In your eyes, do you see yourself more uh, the art of coaching or the science of coaching? Which one is probably, in your eyes, your greater strength? If I had to pick one that I was better at, in my eyes, I'd say, I'd say the art of coaching. Um, the physiology and the science side of it, you do it by default. Um, out of all the coaches and people that I've known over the years, I'll do something training wise because I get a feeling or I think this is what we need to do. And then I'll talk to my friends and like, oh, it's, and they'll give me some crazy term and you're doing it because of this, physio you know, the physiological standpoint of it. I'm like, I, I have no idea. I just watched him. He looked horrible. We need to change it. And we did this. So sometimes I think I, you know, the, yeah, I mean, I've, you know, read a lot of books and I've, you know, talked to a lot of coaches and I understand the whole like physiology to a point. I think we could always get better. But I think it could hurt you when you start getting too technical on those things. I, I really do. That I think at the best coaches, you know, I'll, I'll throw a name out there. I don't know him personally, but Matt Sensuit Sr. I've heard many stories of how he is, he won't use the scientific terms, but he'll just go off a of feeling and he'll make decisions. And I think he might be an extreme one way, but I think that you need to have that side of you. Um, I've met a lot of great coaches scientifically, but they are like just deadbeats when you talk to them. And it's like, you just can't be like that. I think the art, ha I think everything has the science part of it, but I think I'm definitely, if I had to pick one a little bit more than the other, I'd say more the art. Um, I change things a lot. Um, kids in the team will tell you, don't expect to do the workout that you're told. I'm not gonna change it two seconds before, but I wanna know factors. I wanna know what happened last night, how you're feeling. You know, I, ha I have a, I, almost, I it's a weird way to say it, but I almost have a habit, I could say I have it down to a science with Nico. I know him so well as an athlete that I can tell you on his strides if something's wrong. And it's like by knowing that athlete, and that's where I think the art comes into effect, even though there is a science to it. I would say I'm more of an art, you know, focused, if, if, there, if I had to pick one. And I was gonna ask about, okay, so if you go into a workout and you've got something spelled out, so you have no problem adjusting on the fly. Of course, you beat me right to it because then you yeah. led right into that and started talking do, about it. I do it all the time. Which is great. I think sometimes coaches stick to a workout regardless and their kids are I always falling say apart I can, and I say I can they don't notice. I can give you a schedule for the week, but it's going to change. I say it all the time. They know it. Yeah. I don't like to surprise them. They know what physiologically what we're doing that day, what the point of the workout is, which I also educate them. That's a big part of our program too, is educating yeah. the kids on why we do stuff. Okay, as far as coaching, again, you're pretty young into your career as a coach, but what mistake or mistakes have you made that you've learned from that have helped you become a better coach? I think I just took things too serious, maybe, when, when I first started. I, I think I expected everybody to have the same intensity <laughs> and same passion that I have. You know, quickly I learned that it's not just a varsity team. There's a JV team involved that in the beginning, I think I focused too much on the varsity guys that, yeah, one day my JV guys can be varsity. You know, at the high school level, I think this is important, but I have guys and girls on my team that will never make varsity. They just won't. Um, but they're just as important on the team from going to camp in the summer, their personality, and things that I don't think our team will ever forget that 
it's not just about the running because there's a re- like you know Nico and Jace we had they have really good friends in the team that wouldn't you know if their life depended on it, they wouldn't make top seven but their attitude and their support and their um, willingness to work hard and watching Nico and Jace cheer them on in practice is is something that. I think I neglected my first year or two, and I, and I think I'm starting to see that now. Again, I haven't been coaching for tons in high school, so I'm sure there's going to be things that I look back on after this interview and say, "Oh man, I could. I'm gonna, you know, I, I change things five years from now than I used to do." But um, those would say is, is super important is is having everyone involved, and it's easy to not have as much face time with the younger guys not making the team, uh, the varsity team, but they're just as important, and and you need to you need to try to make time for those. Uh, accountability is key. Self-discipline and training is key. How do you emphasize or help instill that self-discipline? These kids need to be intrinsically motivated. I mean, I think that's a big part of it. I think, um, you know, I think as time goes on and, and they have goals and, and we do as a program, as a coach and, and as, a, as the kids and the athletes, I think, I mean, I think it just kind of, it, it's intuition. It, it just, you know, comes to be. I, I think on the lower level, the JV, you might need to be there more. Um, although I have to say, I am not a believer in a coach that can coach via internet or give a workout to a kid. I can't stand when I'm not there watching them. If I have to say, do this and I can't be there, it drives me nuts. Um, I just, I, ha- I like to watch because I think that's how I coach. I change things on the fly for the better, I hope. Um, and I think watching them, but... There is a lot of, um, you know, alone time, you know, you go for runs or a kid's going a eight mile run, a 10 mile run, a 12 mile, whatever it is, or five miles, you gotta be able to do it on your own. At the end of the day, if you don't have that, that focus and you don't have that desire to wanna do it, no one's gonna make you do it. You, you're not gonna survive as a runner if you can't. You know, I should be able to give kids workouts all week and they should be able to do them. I'd like to think they'd be better if I was there because I could help with things as a coach, otherwise, what do you need to coach for? Um, but I think the important part is, is I think over time, just kids get motivated because they want the success. I don't think you're going to see many distance runners that aren't um, self-motivated, that, are at a high, that run at a high level, um, that are able to do things without being watched necessarily. So, I see Newbury Park running very, very good at the end of the season. Yeah. Run well throughout, but super sharp at the end. And a lot of that has to do with the science of coaching, uh, the periodization. You mentioned you guys do your, your highest mileage September or October. Mm-hmm. You guys also do a little bit of different as far as how you approach your schedule. Talk about those things that you do probably differently that help you guys be fresh and fit and fast at the end. Yeah, I mean, I think Newberry Park, we probably do it a lot different than most high schools. I treat it like a, um, as much as I can as a collegiate program. I don't mean the intensity of the workouts, but I mean the mentality of a top NCAA program and uh, a schedule. In college, you won't race a lot. Um, they could race a little bit more in high school. They need to learn how to race. I do get that. But we have gaps of four or five weeks sometimes mid-season with, without a single race. But yeah, number one, you know, it's progressive. We do all of our highest mileage September, October, um, and we keep our mileage pretty high. You know, NXN, if we had a team that was 65 miles a week, they probably run 55 the week of NXN. You know, we just cut a few of the morning runs out and cut a little bit. I don't believe in going down to 30 miles a week like I've seen some programs. You know, we're running, you know, seven, eight miles two days before we race at NXN and some teams are running 15 minutes. I was like, that's insane to me. I just wouldn't do that. Um, so I, I think that's, a, a you know, a big part of our success. But I think what we do peaking wise and, you know, some coaches hate using peaking or or. I think there's a way to do it and a way to do it correctly that I've seen with my own eyes and I've seen work um, from the professional and collegiate end of it, um, especially in the college end of it, you know, you know, having great coaches like Damian Martin and different stuff and, and, you know, Scott Simmons that I've seen personally coach in college or worked with personally that I feel work. They work, they work, and I think we've always been lucky to run our best at state meet NXN or CIF, and I think if you do things right, and you peak right, and you, and you set your mileage appropriately at the right time, a little bit more than that, but I think, um, I think th- the success will come, I really do, at whatever level you could run at. You mentioned the fact that you guys race a bit less. Uh, tell us the reason behind that, and just how different it is from most schools out there. You know, Newbury Park, we race, 
I think a lot less. I think a lot has to do with the California schedule. Like I said, we have um, league championships, which you have to run, CAF prelims, CAF finals, state meet, NXN. That's five races. Like someone recently just asked me, they said, how many times before like postseason do you think you need to race? On the California schedule, we could race once. I think that would be completely fine because I think you could use these other races as rust busters or whatever you want to call them. Um, I think you need to race less, and but you need to have emphasis of being important more on those races you do run at. Um, you know, I like races like Woodbridge because it's fast, it's fun, the atmosphere is insane. You know, and then after that, you know, the only reason why we run Clovis was well, a great imitation, do a great job. Is it's our state meet. You know, that's getting us to NXN, and that's getting you hopefully a state title or podium, whatever you're looking for. Um, so you should know that course. I think not to run that course is a disservice. So. Those are really our only races that we do. Um, and then we have dual meets or, or their cluster meets we have to run, but we're getting to the point that we don't even have to run our top varsity guys because we have such a deep team and we can sit them if we want. A course like Woodbridge, early in the season, uh, you mentioned the atmosphere is insane over there. Uh, it doesn't mean much in the big picture as far as championship, what have you. There's no difficulty there, it's all flat. Yeah. How do you guys approach that course? I mean. We're ready to go to Woodbridge. We approach it. We're ready to go. Um, I, you know, the one thing I also say is the way we training from September on within, we could run extremely fast. Give us two weeks and we'll be, we can be almost top. I think you always, you should always be within two weeks of, of, a, of one of your best performances. So that's how we treat September, October, November, December, but we'll try to do our best obviously at the end, the way we peak and stuff. But, um, we go into Woodbridge as like, it's like a coming out party. It's like, let's show everyone what our summer was. Let's show everything that we've done. Um, let's show our fitness and let's go after it. It's, it's, you run hard. Um, and that's the, that's the, it couldn't be a perfect more time to run that race is in September. It's flat. Probably don't want to do that right before. I mean, you don't want to go for some crazy fast time in October or November because we have other stuff to focus on. Um, but I think that race is awesome because it, it is September. If it was in the middle of October, we probably wouldn't do it. I think having it in the middle, I think it's the middle of September is when it is. It's pretty awesome timing. And um, I just, I think they do a great job. I know people from out of state give us a hard time about it being flat or not three miles, but I mean, I, I hopefully we, we debunked all that when uh, Nico's 1339 turned into his, uh, you know, NXN, you know, champion and all that stuff. And our guys showed that they could run fast at Woodbridge and, I mean, at Woodward Park, you know, where we broke the record there, I think they kind of showed that they were worth those times they ran at Woodbridge. So in the four years you've been coaching in California, head coach cross country, has your philosophy changed at all as to how to run certain courses or has it stayed the same? I think it's pretty much stayed the same. I think our philosophy on certain courses are different than others. Um, and I've definitely not veered from that. Um, you know, Woodward Park to be one is there's a few different ways to look at it, but there's a few different ways to look at everything. Um, you know, we train to run hard from the beginning and that's just how we run. And that's how, and, and if, and if anyone followed us day by day, they would realize that's how we train. So I don't think it's, you know, I think Nico is a perfect point of that. And I think Jason, my other top guys and my girls too. And, you know, they, we train a certain way. And I think there is different, you know, at certain courses, yeah. I mean, I think Woodbridge, you just go after, you have fun. I, I mean, how do you not? It's, plus, you're gonna be stuck behind that crowd if you don't get out. But um, yeah, I think, we, I think we look at things a little different, but it's been good. How do you keep the kids fresh and motivated? I mean, it's, for some schools, it's a long season. The way you guys do it doesn't seem that long. It's pretty, you know, it's pretty carefully chopped up, but how do you keep them fresh? How do you keep them motivated, pumped up? I think, the hardest part of that is uh, we have about a four or five week span where we don't race um, right before league championships. So I think that the hardest part is actually, um, yeah, keeping them motivated, but um, there's a risk to that. But when they race league and they run really well or whatever, we, we let them go for it, give 100%, um, you know, the results. You gotta, you, I think the results from the past years, they've seen that we've had success, we could win after taking a break, not racing a long time or, or focusing on training. We focus a lot on training. There's certain workouts that we have, go-to workouts that the environment would almost be like a race. I don't mean um, them going to the well and being completely dead in the workout, but I mean, we'll have people there, parents there, we have excitement and it's like, this is the focus of this workout. 
We don't need the race. This is the excitement. And I think by doing that, we create something that maybe someone else doesn't create. And that's how you keep it motivated. Do you have a great variance in your workouts from your varsity to your non-varsity? Uh, in your girls, the boys, I know the volume would be a little bit different, most likely, but what else is different? What is common? It is very different, I think, on all the different levels and girls and guys. Um, you know, the, one of the biggest adjustments was figuring out what I was going to do as a, a girls head coach and a guys head coach. I think guys, we do f probably focus a little bit more aerobically than the girls. I think the girls, we focus a little bit more on speed. Um, and, and different things on that, that aspect. Um, it just, I just think it, it works out better that way. But our girls, the volume's not as high, um, but I think we, like, we focus on different stuff. Our JV kids, some of them aren't physically capable of doing a lot, of with our, especially our varsity guys. When our fifth guy, or I mean, sorry, our, our seventh guy is running 1444, it's a little bit hard to have you know, a guy that runs 20 minutes on a JV team or something on the lower end of the J, I think or my slowest guy on the team last year, I think was 21 minutes. So it's like having that guy, he can't do tempos yet. He's not ready. So we have to do cruise miles or we have to do fart licks. And there's definitely different ways. There's a big difference between my varsity. But when I say varsity is working out today, there's about 15 guys. It's not just my top seven. Um, those are guys that are able to handle the same amount of work as they might be a little bit different. One group might do eight th times a K, the other might do six, but they're doing the same intensity style workout. So our girls are about a group of eight or nine, might be a little bit more next year with some, some good girls coming in, but yeah. For those days when you have your top kids running in a certain meet, you guys show up at the course, you guys get out of the bus, and you know, there's definitely an attention on the team. You know, there's Newberry Park and you know, there's Nico or Jace or what have you. A lot of attention. Uh, what's that feel like? And do you do anything to try and get the kids to internalize that attention in a positive way? I mean, I do. I, I think when we show up to races more so this year than ever before, and it may be having a Nico where there's actually people who wanting like autographs and talk and see them, um, you know, I talked to them beforehand and, and there, I mean, they, they need to focus on the task at hand. I mean, I think it's easy to get caught up in that. Um, you know, there's a time to joke around and be, and have fun, but there's a time to be serious. We do a lot. I mean, we, we usually enclose our whole tent in like complete walls. I just, I think there's too much attention sometimes. Sometimes I think it's okay, but no, they, they, I think we're good at that. I think they're good at focusing. It's something I always reiterate, always, you know, even right before we get off the bus or van or whatever we're going, I always tell them, I'm, listen, like you guys, we're here. This is like, it's a little bit of business. Like you represent our school. And anything stupid you say or do, or the way you act, is going to represent everybody. And and you got you got to be the best you know person that you are at these meets because you are representing Newberry Park and you're representing your principal and your district and everything. So I, I think we do a good job with it. I really do. Like I said before, I think we handle pressure really well. Um, I think there's two ways. I think you could simple to sound like, to say this, but you could fold on the pressure. Or you could um, flourish. I think we flourish. I, I really do. I think when we're ranked number one, I think we run well. I think we look at it as a, as a, a badge of honor. Like, let's show them that we deserve this, you know? And you could do it the other way. Like, hey, we're ranked three. Let's go beat the number one team. We've had to do that for most of our, uh, you know, when I've been a coach. But, you know, we might go in maybe next year or part of the year at a certain level. This year we were ranked one at one point. Then we were ranked two or three, depending on what poll you looked at after that. Um, but I, I think we handle it well. I do. I, I think they look at it as a badge of honor. And um, we talk about that in practice all the time. We're not the rankings, but like, listen, like, that we want that pressure. Let's bring it on. I, I welcome it. It's just like in the middle of a race. I can't tell you how many times I've said, you're going to feel like crap. You're going to get to a certain point in this race. Don't think you're going to feel good. You, you know that feeling and you're going to fight it and you're going to run through it. And we talk about this in practice. Same thing with you know, being number one, it's like, no, let's, let's bring it on. I want to be ranked number one. And that's how they, I think that's the better way. Well, I personally, I think it is. So as far as kids getting, getting them set for, or after high school, for those that want to continue running, uh, for some kids, it may help them get to a certain school. Um, how much time do you spend on that? How important is that? You know, I've talked to coaches that said, I don't even do that. Uh, they don't, I don't want to be involved. Very well, like well-known coaches that have been successful in California. I'm the opposite. I will help out as much as I can. Um, I've had kids this year that are going to schools 
because I knew the coach personally and I thought it would be a good fit and it ends up being a great fit for one of, you know, one of the girls, uh, Gretchen's going to Western State. I knew the Western State coach. It's not a normal school that someone would pick. I think the Division II high caliber level is perfect for Gretchen. Um, and the thing is, I, I'll help as much as I can. I'm surprised some college coaches aren't involved more with the high school coaches. If you have a high level boy or girl, I think like not knowing their training or the ins and outs, I think I would wanna know if I was a college coach, you know, what athlete I'm getting and, and you wanna know a little bit more than just their times they see on paper. I think that's the mistake college coaches make, but all the good coaches I had great relationships with, sometimes it, it's crazy because they're calling me all the time and they're just as much as the athlete, but it's fine. I mean, I'll help as much as I can, but I always ask the kid and the parent, if you want me involved, I will. If not, I won't be involved, but I've never had a parent say no. Um, I've helped as much as I can. Some college coaches won't bother as much, but I help as much as I can. I think hopefully with my experience and background, I could help them make a good choice athletically. They got to decide academically what they want. So uh, This year, construction is now complete at Mount Sac, so postseason is going back to Mount Sac. You mentioned before that you're not quite sure if you guys would do the Mount Sac Invitational. Yeah. Uh, wh where are you at now? What are your thoughts on that? We, we are not doing the Mount Sac Invitational. Um, it's not part of our training plan, so um, we, it's part of our window where we um, will go to Riverside or somewhere like that with our JV kids because I think it's just better for them to not run a course that hard before their season ends because we're getting towards uh, league championships. So I'll bring my JV kids to a meet like that um, like we did last year. Um, it might be a race off for our, our seventh, eighth guy. Um, and I don't think doing it at Mount Sac would be fair. But I think, yeah, I mean, I, Mount Sac's a rough one for me. I'm def I definitely side one way with that. It's like, I think it's a, a cool uh, invitation they do every year. To run that course, what, three times in five weeks or something, I think is crazy. We're gonna, we, we're gonna go into it and there's no hiding from it is, um, Let's just get through the motions. I, I don't even know if we're gonna go for the win at CIF finals next year. I think, it's, I think that course could hurt you and really pay the, the effects of uh, the, the downhill is what really worries me. So um, I think physiologically, if we can just get through it the way we wanna get through it, we're gonna focus on state and NXN for hopefully both programs. So, um, you know, people think the other way and, and I respect both ways because I've heard both arguments and there is an argument both ways and I get it. So. Just depends what way you look at it, I guess. The uh, things could not have gone too much better in 2019. You lose a couple really good individuals. You bring back a load of talent and some new faces. What are the goals for 2020? Are those already mapped out or still to come? The goals for 2020 in my head are pretty much mapped out. I mean, I haven't sat down with my guys. We, we've talked about it a little bit um, over the past like few months, um, you know, especially as we've had a lot more um, Zoom meetings than we probably wanted to have. But um, we're, I think we're going to be a better team. I think we're not going to have a, a, a one like a Nico. Um, but I think we have got a guy that could be a Jace for my one. And my young guys are very, they're young, but they're guys that don't falter. Like, you know, they're, they're my sophomores, I have guys that I never have to worry. On race day, they, they show up and things happen. Um, I think my team's gonna be harder to make. I think my seventh is gonna be faster. That will be closer to a team like how Great Oak was more of a pack, um, which will be new for us at Newberry Park. But I think that we, are, we have one or two outliers that are gonna be up front. Um, and the way they're going now, it's gonna be really good. And then my other guys are gonna be, I think, it's, we're going to become, like at Woodward Park, we could probably come close to that record again if I had to say within three or four seconds. It's just, we're just not going to have that, you know, when we go to, um, when we go to Woodbridge, we're not going to have a 1339, but we could have a 1359. And we could have a lot of guys in 1410 to 1420. So. You had a situation this year, you had two All-Americans in your squad, the only high school that had two All-Americans on one roster. Um, Nico, obviously, an all-time talent. Uh, and Jace, pretty incredible for a number two runner. Is there anything that you had to do to adjust to make sure that their individual talents were maximized while having the team focus still? Was that a juggling act or, or, or not really? Yeah, I mean, I think to get them, you know, we had a few things, you know, Jace at one point was ahead of Nico and as a sophomore in cross country, Nico stepped up after that uh, sophomore year at track and then they kind of traded positions as one and two. 
Um, cause Jace was our number one guy as a sophomore, um, in cross country and that we were still a young team then. And then Nico kind of grew into himself and just, yeah, he, things flourished for him and he became obviously the athlete he was. I always knew both of them would be phenomenal athletes. I think that it was a li- it was hard for Jace at times, his junior year. I think he struggled a little bit where he was running less. Um, he wasn't running as well as he was capable of because of how well Nico was running. Um, and I think he struggled with that a little bit. I just, I think personally did. And, but I think both those guys helped my team. Everyone knew where to key off of those guys. Jace, once he started realizing where he can key off of Nico, then my teams knew where they, the rest of my team need to, knew where they needed to key off of Jace. We, we had it down. I mean, and then Jace, I think shocked a lot of people running 1453 or something up at Woodward Park, um, you know, even what he did this spring, he is just able to, um, he pretty much is Nico's shadow as a junior. He's running almost the same times Nico did as a junior. He ran low 14 minutes at Woodbridge. You know, we went under 15 minutes at Woodward Park. And it just, I think you, having those two up front helped our team, but they knew where they needed to be. And it will be different next year, but it'll, it'll be good. We've covered a great deal already about just the program in general, what makes the program tick and successful. Anything that we may have left out that you think would, you, know, you want to share, it'd be good to go ahead and talk about? In general, I think people use the word culture and they, they always want to change culture. But I think um, it's something that has to happen organically um, to, to an extent. And I think that, you know, something that makes these kids special is like they, they have this weird desire to be the best in the country. And I think um, it's contagious. And I think my freshman kids and my and the girls now, my freshman girls coming in, want to be a part of the state championship team. I think um, it's going to be hard to keep it going, but I think it's going to be fun. And I think that I believe this is just the beginning of Newberry Park. I don't think they're going to, I, I think we're going to be a lot better in my teams to come. And girls for sure and guys for sure too. So.